It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. A recent study found that 83% of Americans consider worry about the nation's future a significant source of stress. And while it is a stressful time, today's guest Karen Brailsford believes that it is a period of tremendous possibility and transformation. According to Karen, when we consciously choose to align with the divine within, we tap into wellsprings of faith, hope, and connection. Karen is the mother of actress Amanda Stenberg, and she was her manager for years. She has worked on the staff at Newsweek, L, People in Touch, and E! Entertainment. Karen is a licensed spiritual practitioner at the Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles and is the author of the book Sacred Landscapes of the Soul Aligning with the Divine Wherever You Are. Welcome Karen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So Karen, you started your career as a journalist. How did you end up on the journey of being a spiritual therapist? Although I was a journalist and that was something that I aspired to even as a young kid, I remember, you know, in sixth grade, seventh grade, wanting to write. I actually think the two careers are aligned. As a journalist, my job was to um, get the story, and the way I would get the story would be by connecting with individuals. I remember having the sense of sitting down with um, whether they were celebrities or candidates for human interest stories. What I was doing in each exchange was connecting. I basically having a namaste moment with everyone. And so, It seemed very organic and natural to segue from that into being a spiritual therapist or guide. I had always been interested in a spiritual life. I'd always wanted to cultivate my spiritual spirituality. And um, I remember as a kid, every year I would put on my list of aspirations for the next year, I would write to be closer to God. So that was something that was innate within me. It was also cultivated by my mother, who was deeply spiritual. And and so I like to say that the journey didn't all of a sudden, I didn't all of a sudden appear um, wanting to become a spiritual therapist or guide, but that it was something that was nurtured within me from inception, probably before inception. So you just so said here that are. one of your goals was to develop a closer relationship with God. So how do you define God? I think um, I define God as this innate indwelling power or presence. It's an awareness. I don't define it as a being in the sky. I believe that it's everywhere. I believe that it's so profound and so omniscient and omniactive and available to everyone that one can find it in the stars. One can find it in the trees one can find it within oneself, that it's really just an awareness that there is something greater than what we can see or discern with the senses, and that it um, longs to cultivate a relationship with us, and it shows up in everything and everyone. And that's what you write about in your new book, Aligning with the Divine Wherever You Are. And and you also focus on a, a sacred landscape of the soul. So what does that actually mean to you? Like, what, what is a landscape of the soul? So what I um, decided to do, or rather, I would say spirit, and that's my go-to word in Mm -hmm. terms of how I define God. I call it spirit. What spirit brought forth through me was this idea that um, in different stages of our lives, at different points in time, in different points of the day, that we might um, feel a certain emotional um, resonance, and it might look as confusion. It might look as a sense of being afraid of what to do next. It might look as a sense of wanting to create and that you're ready to birth something that you haven't even thought of before. Or it might look like you feel this 
overall sense of connectedness and oneness with what I call the presence or spirit or God. Um, you might feel that, for instance, while you're taking a jog. So what I decided to do was to really um, hone in on these different nine uh, landscapes. And I um, came up with nine. And the landscapes range from everything from the forest where you're confused and you're not quite sure. Um, you're feeling chaotic. You're feeling the opposite of peace. Um, and then one might move on to the landscape of the plateau where you really don't know what to do next. And from there, there's the landscape of immobility or the tundra where you're literally frozen with fear. And so I move through these different landscapes. Those are just the first three. And from that particular terrain, which I define as the terrain of confinement, one might segue into the terrain of gestation where there's the valley, which is the landscape of solace when you're seeking peace and the landscape of uh, the riverbank, the sense of anticipation. And finally, one might land in the landscape of the ocean where you're feeling this sense of oneness and you're ready to remember who and whose you are. You have emerged into this sense of, wow, I am one with this presence, this inescapable divine. There is the mountaintop, the landscape of mission. When you have an idea that, ah, I know exactly what my purpose is. And even if I don't know exactly what it is, I do know that I have a, a purpose. And finally, there's the landscape of surrender, which I call vastness. And that's where you do have this sense of that, oh my goodness, <laughs> life is so full. Life is so magnificent that there are no limits that you are dancing the dancer radiance, which happens to be one of the pieces in that section, and that indeed you are one with the one, you and this presence, that you're not separate from it, that it is who you are and you are who it is. And one of the things that you write in the, about in the book, and I love the words that you used, you, you say that there are hallelujahs in the hurricanes, and that's actually something that I have come to learn over the, pa the course of the, the past 10 years of my life, 10 years ago, which was at the, the root of all of the work that I'm doing now, I went through a really um, horrific loss. And in a period of six months, my 23-year marriage ended, my mother died, my sister died, and my oldest son left for college. And I'd already lost my father and brother. So I, at one point, had this identity, this life, and, and quite literally, overnight, it was gone. I was no longer a wife, a daughter, a sister, the mother, the way I knew it. And I've come to see that there are blessings in every situation. Sometimes you have to look a little harder to find them, but they are always there. And I, I just love the words that you used, hallelujah in the hurricanes, because that is so true. And I've lived it. Mm, um, thank you, Jonas. You were, you were sharing about your loss of and the transitions that you went through, I was just holding the space and just honoring you um, and honoring those um, those experiences. And indeed, there are hallelujahs in the hurricanes. Thank you for honing in on that particular phrase. Um, the idea is that life is full of changes. And I know that um, having a child of my own, having a daughter, and then as parents, um, there's this idea that we want to protect our children. We want to give them this sense of stability. And I'm thinking it would really behoove us to really teach that life is fluid and it's always flowing. And so what we really want to teach our children and ourselves <laughs> is that we have to be able to, to dance with it, that we have to be able to flow with it. And there's certain techniques and tools that one can learn to um, in order to ride the wave, so to speak. And key, and per perhaps the very first um, understanding, is to accept that, yes, things are going to change and that this is the natural order of things. Now, this isn't to, this isn't to uh, deny the pain or the sorrow. I have such compassion for um, what others are experiencing, especially now in this particular point in time. But um, as you suggested at the top of our conversation, this is also a time for tremendous growth. 
we are all being cajoled, forced really, into being present with what is, to really taking stock of what has come to pass, to take stock of our systems, to take stock of um, how we structure our society, and we are really being called to um, create something new. Mm-hmm. And that might look like in the bigger picture, a new way of looking at the world, a new way of operating the world. And for the individual, it might look like a way of where do I want to live? Do I really want to live here? What do I want to do with my life? What's my purpose? How can I contribute? How can I serve? All of these questions are coming into play in such a dramatic way because it's involving everyone. I mean, these are questions that I think on any given day, in any given year, in any given century that individuals have been and will continue to face. But now it seems that we're all facing it together because we're all bound up in what has the appearance of devastation and loss and transitions. And it's all happening for everyone. You just open up a newspaper, you listen to the news, and and we are being um, bombarded with with very trying circumstances but i do believe that now is the time that we we get to hmm, the phrase nitty-gritty just came to me we get to get down into it into the muck and mire and we get to really decide who am i who am i now who do i want to be and yes how do i want to serve and i believe that we can't serve unless we put on our own oxygen masks. And so my book, Sacred Landscapes of the Soul, is a bomb, I believe. It's a way to take stock, to to dive into the solace, to dive into our emotions, to be present with what is. I don't believe in pretending that things aren't bad or pretending that things aren't challenging um, and to just bypass our real emotions. So this is a way of diving deep into where we are and then transcending where we are. And I believe it's possible to transcend circumstances. We've had examples through the ages of that. Right. And I, and I agree. And and I think, you know, your book is, it's a wonderful guide because what you were saying, what we're all experiencing today, I'm all about outlook and how you view things. And we really are being brought to a point where we can make the decision. And I want to emphasize that we have power here because we're all feeling powerless. We have the power to decide, will I allow this to defeat me and to hold me down? Or will I look for infinite possibilities? Will I stay in faith? Will I find my true self? And and that's where I think our, our power really comes in. Mm, it's, Absolutely. I completely agree, Joan. The idea is that we get to we get to choose that we aren't powerless. I mean, think about it. We have we have everything that we need. We have the intelligence, the radiance, the love, the compassion, the skills. I believe that we are innately divine. And so all of that, all of that richness, all of that beauty, all of that joy is possible regardless of what is happening outside of of us in the outer world. And once we cultivate that inner world, we are stronger, we are um, grace-filled, we're even more dynamic, and we can go out and acknowledge what is happening and still create and serve and give and love, that we're propelled by this innate inner love and indwelling presence. And Karen, is that what you've always been able to do. So for example, your daughter is a well-known actress and you managed her and you're part of the Hollywood world. And, you know, to the outside, Hollywood seems to be, you know, a little bit more cutthroat, competitive. It, It has its own characteristics. Do you ever feel a disconnect being a spiritual person in a world that may not always be so kind? I think it's incumbent upon those who have a sense of spirituality and a sense of um, an awareness that, you know, all the glitter and all the gold is not really what it's all about. I think it's incumbent upon those of us who have even an inkling of this to bring that spirituality to light and to alter 
the situations and alter what's happening in our government or, you know, in Hollywood. Um, I think believe that's why we're here. I just flashed in a memory of um, my daughter was auditioning for the Hunger Games, and um, I believe it was the second audition. Certainly, it was at the home studio of the director, and um, I sat in his very cozy living room, and I held vigil. I closed my eyes, and I was in meditation, and I was just holding space for her and what was happening um, outside in her audition. And I really had this sense that something powerful was happening. I was very focused and centered on this. So I think that's what um, those of us who believe that um, the world is a is fruitful and abundant and that there's so much that we can do to, to, to bring that um, to the attention of others and therefore shift, um, shift the power, shift this idea of what's important that those of us who have even, you know, just a tiny awareness that that's what we're here. And it doesn't necessarily look like sitting outside of an audition and holding space. It can look like um, you're going to the polls and volunteering. It could look Mm -hmm. like voting. It could look like um, praying. You know, it could look like any number of things, as long as you're bringing that sense, that awareness, that deep um, acknowledgement that, yes, I am here. I am here to bring forth my gifts. I am here to share. I'm here to to be a beneficial presence in the world. And again, it doesn't really matter if you're in Hollywood or in government. I think, you know, if you're sweeping the floors, you can bring that excellence to that particular task as well. And when you know who you are and you're strong from within, it doesn't really matter what's going on around you. Exactly, exactly. Um, What I find, um, we talked earlier about my own spiritual journey, And um, what I have found that when you are aware and you have more tools in the tool chest, whether it's meditation or a sense of um, praying or certain readings or reciting affirmations, and my book is full of affirmations and inspiring um, epigraphs from three uh, millennia, um, that you have tools that you can draw upon and that you can apply. And so I find that perhaps the gap lessens the gap between seeing what's happening and being disturbed by it perhaps becomes a little less wide because one has these tools doesn't for me doesn't mean that I'm not impacted by what happens in the outside world at all but I just am totally oblivious to it doesn't mean that at all it means and sometimes at some times that I might just be aware that oh let me go meditate right now oh I'm triggered (laughs) <laughs> let me go within, let me go within be, and let me read this passage or let me recite this phrase. Oh, yes, there are hallelujahs in the hurricane. Um, and and sometimes it might be that I'm not even moved. So, um, But I do believe we are human beings and we are walking the planet and we are aware of what's going on about us around us it doesn't mean that we necessarily have um shut ourselves down from feeling or seeing what's happening but indeed we have the tools to get back to center and when we nurture ourselves with our spiritual practices then the stronger we are karen you you had the opportunity to fulfill one of your bucket list items and and i would assume that checking this item off your list was very good for your soul During the events leading up to President Obama's first inauguration, you sang with the choir that backed up John Legend. Can you tell us about that experience? It was so empowering. Um, Leading up to that experience, I remember being, it was so exciting. Um, There was this sense of movement, this sense of change, this sense of, um, this sense of of being able to bring forth this new vision. And so um, I traveled with Agape's um, choir to Denver, and we uh, performed with John Legend and um, different incarnations of the choir performed with Will I Am and 
we also um, appeared uh, on Oprah's show. She broadcast from the Kennedy Center. So it was just a flurry of activity and singing and um, really bringing forth this sense of um, purpose and change and dynamism that we could change the country, that we could, um, that we were ushering in something new. So it was, it was so exciting to be there. Um, and um, the energy was palpable. The energy, I remember um, being at the stadium and I was there with um, my family and the idea that we were part of something bigger than us, that there was the sense that um, we could change the world. Certainly if the country was changing. So it was exciting. It was dynamic. And singing is such a way to, um, to bring forth this, this um, innate indwelling presence. I find that it's a way of uniting and coming together um, and so, yes, it was a it was a fantastic experience, and I was really glad to be a part of it. The book is Sacred Landscapes of the Soul. If you'd like to get more information about Karen and her work, you can visit KarenBrailsford.com. And as always, you can visit our website, CYACYL.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read our digital magazine, and be sure to sign up for our mailing list. Karen, in our final moments, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? Huh. What came to me immediately was that life is good. Life is good. We are here in the body, right here, right now, that we have come for such a time as this. And so it's incumbent for each one of us to find what it is we're going to deliver in this crucial time, right here, right now. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Joan. I'm sending you infinite blessings. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.